I know more Mickey Mouse Clubhouse episodes than I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hot dog, hot dog, hot diggity hot dog. Diggity dog. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's burned in every father's head. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. We really hope you enjoy these podcasts. I'm sure you know that this is a labor of love for us. So we have a Patreon campaign to help generate the funds necessary for the show to continue. Patreon is like a mix of NPR plus Kickstarter. It's crowdfunding for supporting your favorite grassroots entertainment, but you also get some awesome stuff in return. We have different donation levels set up. So $1 a month gets you Patreon-only content, such as the raw interviews, including all the footage of outtakes and raw audio that takes place before and after the recording. For $3 a month, we send you a Bourbon Pursuit branded koozie, as well as some Bourbon Pursuit branded stickers that you can slap on your laptop, guitar case, car window, or wherever. For $5 a month, you get a Bourbon Pursuit t-shirt, as well as get put into a monthly drawing where we've given away books, swag from some of our guests, and even bottles of bourbon. At $10 a month, I'm going to ship you out a sample of bourbon from my own personal bar. So please, if you like the show, support us, and we're going to send you some cool stuff in return. Remember that even $1 goes a long way. Visit patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. We are here with the fifth edition of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. We've got our very bold guest of uh, panelists over here. We've got, uh, we are close to almost 30 viewers online right now. So anybody that has never joined us before, we always put out the the links on the Bourboner Facebook group, on our Twitter handles, everywhere you can find Facebook um, pages, everything like that. And you can actually get the YouTube link and be able to watch this happening in real time and, and ask your questions as they go. So, uh, of course, Kenny, host of Bourbon Pursuit. We got Ryan here tonight as well. Ryan, how you doing? Good, sir. Kenny, how are you, man? I'm doing well. You know, we're, uh, we're rocking and rolling. I'm, I'm two episodes today. Rocking. I know. Right. We're trying to, we're just trying to knock them out left and right. Absolutely. And that's what, uh, I felt like, I felt like I've been drinking all day because we started drinking <laughs> this morning with, uh, interviewing somebody. And then I've had people coming over, picking up bottles. And of course you got to have a drink with them when they come over. And now I'm, now I'm drinking with you all. So, so you're going to be on point for this one. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to be feeling it. So, uh, so good. Um, you know, with that, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists once again. Uh, Carrie, we'll start with you. Carrie, uh, Suburbia, www.suburbia.com. Follow me on Twitter at bourbon underscore gamer. And uh, I just like to be here to make fun of Blake, who looks like he dropped again. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jordan, go for it. Yeah, sure. This is Jordan from uh, Breaking Bourbon, one of the three guys that run Breaking Bourbon. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, our website at Breaking Bourbon. Um, latest news and release calendar, and of course, reviews. I'm Blake from bourboner.com. Uh, I run the, the the site, the blog, and all the social media. So just released our Bourboner Whiskey of the Year. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so excited to be a part of it tonight. Good. Well, glad everybody's able to be on here tonight. I think we've got a, a pretty good agenda and kind of good topics amount to cover. But really, there's there's one big thing that kind of shook up the world this week and maybe not the world, but I guess, you know, our world. And that was the news that Smooth Ambler, somebody that was a recent guest of ours, they've been getting praises because they have almost like a they're kind of getting up there with Willet, Lair, almost like a cult like following everybody that wants to um, get these releases called like Jawbreaker and all these other ones that are out there. And it's, it's starting to get heavily sought after. And they announced this week that they are discontinuing their private barrel program, which means no more private picks um, up until this point. So I kind of want to toss it over to, uh, to, to Jordan first, like kind of what's your thoughts on this and um, you know, sort of what do you think it's really stemming from? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's really interesting, right? So I think it was inevitable just because I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to go down to their distillery and see their location. Really cool, really cool spot in West Virginia. Tiny, and they're really trying to fill up their um, warehouses that they're building with their own distillate. So that makes sense, right? At the same time, they're just they're just slowly dwindling down on their on their age stuff. And um, I think it was inevitable. I think the timing could have been a little better, you know, with them with them selling. I think a lot of people are going to blame the uh, acquisition is really why they're doing it. But I just think, honestly, I think it was just a supply thing. 
A um, little bit surprising because they could clearly buy more from um, their source and keep filling up their stocks. But uh, at the same time, I think it's smart, right? I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can put off their own product as they continue to age that. Hopefully, they'll start having some some of their own barrel picks and some of their own age products out there. Still a shame I have a bunch of their bottles, but I don't know. It is what it is, I guess. Yeah, and, and with that, you know, they they they're pretty transparent, right? So yeah. everything that they they've kind of done for those parics are are all coming from MGP. Um, yeah. They are releasing their own their own weeded bourbon that's supposed to be coming soon. Uh, Blake, kind of uh, give us your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think it's just a, a product of success, and and it's a good problem to have for them. Uh, but for for the consumer, it kind of sucks. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the new acquisition had something to do with that. You know, you think about it, each barrel, I don't know how long it would just take to bottle their regular smooth ambler single barrels. But if you do a private barrel, you got to bring somebody in, you got to talk about a logo, you got to do this tasting, you got, you know, there's a whole lot more work and everything around each barrel. And, you know, when the plan is for growth, it, they're just, it's not a massive operation where they really have that kind of capacity to kind of just let sit there you know if it takes an hour to do a regular single barrel my guess is it takes five hours plus to do a private barrel um and when you already have the demand that they have it's just going to be one of the first things to go you know we saw the same thing with Willet about what did they cut it off maybe three years ago um Mm -hmm. basically everybody scaled back kevin hill has put everything on pause now they just just started releasing some more elijah craig uh single barrels but you know i think it's just a product of being successful and when something's way too or really popular it's not great for the consumer a lot of times you know the diehards who've kind of supported them with this these programs for a long time um not that they're turning their back on the consumer or anything but you know the the private barrels are fun and they do a really good job with them. So, yeah, and I, I kind of push it over to you, Carrie. Like, do you really think it's a product of uh, kind of being owned by a bigger person now? Because I guess you know we we all work in industries where we kind of see a, a bottom line. And you kind of see how to how do we streamline things? How do we make it faster and kind of churn more money? And I, I can totally understand your argument of being able to say that yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a byproduct of putting more time and effort into something that necessarily at the end of the day, isn't making you more money. I think it's three things, honestly. Number one, I think that um, Smooth Ambler is a small company. And like Blake was saying, it's kind of a pain in the butt for them to do private barrels. They, um, there's a lot involved, you know, Four Roses that does private barrels all the time. They've got a separate warehouse for it. Smooth Ambler. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, they're a small company. They're a small group. And so it's, you know, and John Little will even tell you it's it's a it's kind of a pain for them to do private barrels, and they started to slow down a little bit. I think also on the other hand, if you look at what's on store shelves now, it's all the smooth ambler single barrels, right? So they took the same barrel that was a pain for them that they were selling to people, and they began to sell it, you know, distribute it nationwide, and they're saying, you know, here we are making money from these barrels, more money from these barrels, and it doesn't require any effort that's involved in the private barrel. So I think Mm -hmm. you have the the company not able to handle it, but also from a financial standpoint, like why not take all the remaining barrels of the inventory that you have and just label it with a single barrel, spread it out and make your money that way from it. Um, I think also just the supply um, has dwindled. We all know supply issues are everywhere. Um, You know, the the demand is definitely higher than supply. So I think it's just, it's three things to it. And, you know, I do feel bad. Our whiskey group was up for um, a barrel this year, but you know, I can understand it. And at least what I appreciate is that they're honest about everything and they've been honest the whole time. So cheers to them for at least being honest about everything. Absolutely. And, and so sure. I guess that, that kind of dovetails into the next question that I'll, I'll push over to you, Ryan, is there's been a lot of articles thing that uh, MGP is going to be facing a lot of a lot of heat and a lot of pressure because they're not going to be able to fulfill um, the orders that they've either promised to people or whatever it is because um, going from you know 200 distilleries nationwide to a thousand distilleries nationwide and everybody wants to have something to sell on day one and uh, what's the what's the one thing everybody always thinks of when they say I need to sell something oh 
it's going to be MGP. And so they, uh, they're, they're definitely feeling, I guess the, um, the squeeze, I guess you could say. Absolutely. What was the question? You're going to kind of like, you know, <laughs> what, what do you really think, uh, you know, MGP's stance on this, you know, do you think that they're going to be, um, you think they're really hurting? Uh, and then I guess another question for you is how are they going to be really hurting here in say maybe four to six years, uh, four to eight years when everybody that is sourcing from them that is already actually distilling right now is going to have enough product that they say, Oh, thanks MGP. That was fun. You know, four talk to you later. We don't later. Yeah, I agree. It's amazing. I'm still amazed that there's MGP stock out there, just given how many distilleries, startups there are. And, you know, there's stuff popping up here locally. And you're like, where's that from? It's from MGP. So I can definitely see where the the squeeze is happening. And I I would be concerned. I'm sure they might have predicted this, but nobody's predicted this. And I, I don't know. I've never been there because they're kind of a closed book. MGP is, I guess they have to be with you know, how many clients they service, but you don't really know how much about their operation, what they can handle and so forth. So I don't really know, but it, it is surprising that they still have stock available to keep supplying these new distilleries. And that's where I think somebody like the Bardstown Bourbon Company, who's going to be doing something similar, can have a niche in the market and also provide competition um, because that's what their main goal is to be a uh, distiller, a contract distiller for for companies wanting to bring bourbon to the market. Well, don't you have some new? I mean, you. I think you're the one who told me that about Bart Sound Bourbon Company. Or yeah, Bart Sound Bourbon Company basically is already sold out. I mean, they're done. Yeah, Constellation Brands bought. Uh, I want to. They didn't buy total up business, but it was like thirty or forty percent of it. And uh, all these companies are kind of getting into this craft distilling because I think it's kind of the future. With like with craft beers. Most yep. beers that we drink now are craft beers, and I think the big companies are going to always have their stable products, but these craft whiskeys are going to be the ones pushing the limits and doing new things to where us as consumers are going to be willing to try and so forth. So I think it's just the big boys trying to get in there as well. And so I'll push it to uh, somebody else on the panel. Like, what do you think is going to happen to MGP here in um, three years, six years, nine years, whatever? Well, how in the world could they run out of whiskey i mean the place is huge they've been making whiskey for how long i mean eventually why aren't they going to replace the barrels that they've sold and they've got gigantic warehouses everywhere right so i and everybody's buying from them. i don't i don't get yeah. it I mean, but i mean the, the, we don't know that they're that they didn't just overextend themselves i know they were kind of expanding into their own brand they were doing all these other mash bills you know they added like seven or eight mash bills um, and I was actually just Googling, I forgot, I'm pretty sure they're publicly traded. So I'm looking at their yeah. financials now. Um, so this is where, you know, an accounting degree really comes in handy is when you want to look up whiskey companies. Um, you know, 2015 is a pretty healthy looking company. Um, but you know, who knows what 2016 will hold. Um, so I think it's kind of hard to say, you know, that they're still working with a pretty high cost of sales um so margins are slimmer you know it looks like in 2015 they're working with Should about we buy 18, the stock like what do you 18 percent <laughs> <laughs> so i mean there when when you have customers banging on your door to get your yeah. product do you just sell it all and i've kind of looked at you know sourcing some other stuff with this other distillery and the only stuff that's on the market from them is two maybe four years old um so maybe they really did just sell through all of their older stock and just now they're going to be in a waiting period of a couple years to you know they took the cash flow and now they're going to wait um but i haven't seen much available aged mgp on the market for a year or so at least didn't greg um, uh greg metzi leave yeah, yeah he he got, and that yeah. was kind of a weird thing kind of, too it seems like he got pushed out almost yeah, because it was like, yeah. hey, he's been here for however many years. It's like and 20 was, years. Yeah, and then it, all they did was just put out an announcement and say, one of our master distillers. Because yeah. um, I think people forget that too is, you know, they're owned by, they have like all these other sister companies that make Sky Vodka or I don't know, I forget what all it is. Um, you know, we look at it as a bourbon company and really that's just a, another segment. Yeah. Um, 
I think they'll be, I think they'll be okay in a few years. I mean, so one of the things we did for this, like our 2016 year in review was talk with SKU and, uh, you know, find out how many new whiskey just distilleries opened up. So last year alone, another 125 distilleries, right? So it's not slowing down. And now it's to the point where some of these guys are almost a distillery quote unquote name, right? So they could have a super small still, but they're still just buying, even if it's new to still it from mm-hmm. MGP. And I think as long as like the growth keeps happening, they're just going to keep, I mean, they're going to be okay. Even if their business model switches from their age stock to just, mm-hmm. you know, being like the main distiller producer for these smaller places that really can only produce a little bit on their own and just need to source everything else. Cause there could be a lot of these guys who would just rather buy it and age it themselves. You yeah. know, they don't want to go through the, the massive, even if you're working with like a 500 gallon still, you're maybe getting one barrel a day. Um, yep. Yeah, and then you could get bought out by, you know, a major corporation. <laughs> That's the plan. I don't, I don't know why we're on this podcast right I know. now. We should just be planning that out. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it's pretty it's a good good way to look at it. So uh, Kyle Anderson, kind of back on the whole smooth ambler said said I hope it's not an industry trend because private barrels are a great consolation prize, especially if you miss out on a limited edition release or any kind of allocated stuff. Um, and sometimes, to be honest with you, some of the barrel picks are actually better than a lot of the allocated stuff that's out there. So just gotta. I would say my one comment about it is like the barrel programs are awesome, but think about how easy it is to get a barrel and any group could form and buy a barrel and eventually you got to realize with bourbon being so hot, you know, it's going to take a hit inventory wise. will take a hit. Anybody that does these barrel programs, the, I had heard a rumor and I don't know if you guys have heard this or not, but four roses, when they do their barrel picks, they roll out a set number of barrels from you. Yeah. It's 10. Yeah. They roll out. Yeah. Uh, it's now down to three. Was what yeah, I no, it's uh, whenever I went in June, I think we had six because there were no K and no V recipes i think it's i had heard it's down to three now but wow have not verified that but it's you know it's 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 here's awesome a, the barrel. It's the so three worst ones. I, I started a whiskey group here but you know it, i just think that the demand is gonna exceed the supply for right now yeah i think it's 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 funny if you look at if anybody just goes and looks at their collection and they go look at some of their four roses barrel picks from maybe like 2012, 2014, and they'll see that it's it's somewhere north of 10 years. It could be 10 years, mm-hmm. 11 years, 12 years. And you go look at anything on the shelves today, it's nine years, yeah. uh, nine years and nine and a half months uh, to and less than that, maybe even eight years in some cases. So you can even see that uh, four roses is gonna they're gonna start struggling here in a little bit too because they're not gonna have age stock. So. Uh, finding anything that's over 10 years is, is going to be kind of tough to find now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen a 10 year old pick from them in probably over a year. Long time. Yeah. Um, Let me throw a question out at you guys. Do you think that, and this may be further on your list, but just got me thinking about it, but I went into total wine today and browsed shelf after shelf after shelf of bourbon and they're everything that you could imagine from from you know beginner to intermediate bourbon is on the shelf, and there was not a single one that I was even interested in buying. <laughs> is that a product of the the hobby that we're in? Are we at the end of the glut that we just have so much that we're? No, it's just that I we, think it's we know what we like. Yeah, yeah, we personally own too much, so therefore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're looking at, you know, a hundred bottles at your house and you're like, okay, do I really want to buy this mid-level bottle that I know everything about and I know (laughs) you're a much choosier buyer now? But I think that's a better way to put it. You you become a choose your buyer. And not yeah. only that is you got to think we're, when we all started this years ago, uh, we were all uninformed buyers, right? Um, mm-hmm. you, know, was, you know, four rows of small batch, just regular small batch was like, that was my splurge. Like that's, you know, other than that, it was, it was just regular old Forrester. Uh, now uh, me just drinking four rows of small batch, the only time I do it is probably if I go somewhere else mm-hmm. and it's at somebody else's house. I, I don't typically go to the store and buy it because, well, I've got 19 other bottles of four roses here. I don't need another bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're spoiled is what you're saying. The, the snobbery is very yeah. high in it's real. the urban world. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's yeah. that's yeah, that's an easy way to put it. But so, is it, is it us that drives this whole market though? Is it the high end 
enthusiast to drive the market or is it the, the guy who reached for the Jim Beam handle in front of me today that drives this market? Based well, on some of those pictures on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, I think it's it's a lot of those guys too because there's some people who go from like, you'll see a post, it's like, oh, I just started this hobby four months ago and it's like 50 bottles of bourbon just sitting in their yeah. house, right? A lot uh, of it's just stuff you can buy off the shelf and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> Did you buy out a bar? Or I mean, it's- <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's, you know, and we're the ones to blame on getting everybody caught up on all the limited release stuff because it seems like, oh, that's all there is to talk about, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which I mean, I kind of feel the same way. Like, I, I've slowly been getting into wine, and my first thought is, oh man, how, how do I taste these, you know, this first growth Bordeaux that I need to try? And it's like, I don't even know the difference between the $4 bottle of wine from the gas station. <laughs> Why don't I taste through, you know, at least get my variables down before I jump into this hundred dollar bottle of red wine that, um, but I think everyone has that same. It's like, Oh, uh, I like bourbon now and I like Jim Beam black. Why don't I find Pappy? And, you know, why don't I hunt after a George T stag? But cause I hear it's right. great. And those people come no. to our house and we give them the really, really rare good stuff. And what does that do? That makes them want the really, really good rare stuff. It's our yeah. animal. Yeah. It, 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 you know, you see it in all these Facebook groups of people just getting into bourbon. And it's like, just picked up a William Leroux Weller today. And I'm thinking, well, th- those were all the bottles that I used to get in my city. <laughs> and <they're now laughs> the good old days. Like I just used to pick them up because I knew the system. And now there's, you know, 500 other people waiting outside before the store even opens. Like this isn't Kentucky. This is, this yeah. is Jacksonville. <laughs> I think it's definitely social media and FOMO. Like, yeah. you know, you, you see a picture of a bottle or something and you're like, I got to have it, got to have it. Or, you know, your fear of missing out yeah. on that special yeah. bottle or whatever. So that's very true, man. Fear That has driven rare releases for so long. Because like, even though I said my goal this year is not to, I'm going to like stay away from limited releases. But when they start coming, I know I'm going to have like FOMO. Like, <laughs> oh, no, they're coming out. It might be one of the best ever. But the thing is, they're going to come out with it again next year, you know, and it, but mm-hmm. whatever. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it happens right. with the, just, I mean, the, like, look at the last year, quite 12 year, right? They took away the age statement. People are buying cases of this. It's like, yeah. what? Well, bookers, people. Don't look at that. Yeah, that's crazy. Bookers just because they hinted at uh, changing the price. Um, it's nuts. It's a mob mentality, but at yeah. some point, the mob is just going to get tired of the same old stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. All you right. sound like we, a bunch of bitter old men right now. <laughs> 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 <That's my laughs> <lawn. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't think we're that old yet. <laughs> All right, so so let's let's move on to the next piece. So let's kind of talk about uh, a, t- a quick 2016 wrap up. So Blake just finished his. Bourboner survey of bourbon of the year. So uh, give us the drum roll and, and the results. Okay. I'll, I'll let uh, Kenny put the sound effects in with the drum roll for the, for the main cut. But uh, so third place was Four Roses, small batch, limited edition. Second place, which actually first and second, uh, both got around 800 or 900 votes a piece. And they were like six votes apart. But second place was Booker's Rye. And then the first place was William LaRue Weller. You know, I, that, that didn't surprise me too much. Um, you know, in regards of the, the allocation, the ability to be able to, or the availability of being able to get it nationwide, um, you know, it didn't surprise me considering there were, what, 12,000 bottles of Weller that went out this year, William LaRue yeah. Weller, and there was 9,000 bottles of uh, Booker's Rye. So, um, with that, you've immediately got more people with hands on bottles that can try it. Um, so there's definitely a whole heap of people that didn't get to try it. Um, I, for one, did my own write in on it. And I had to say that my bourbon of the year was the Heaven Hill Select Stock Pre Fire 20 year. I'm and, with you. I opened and, that with you. It's really yes. good. And I, I mean, haven't tried it yet. It really good. Oh, it's it, fantastic. And really. see, that's the problem that there were only what? 200 bottles of this stuff released yeah. and so yeah. uh you know when yeah. 3,000 people try to go and write in their bourbon of the year they uh they don't they don't get to try some of the uh the fruits of being able to be here in kentucky and go to the go to the distillery and pick one of these up that's kind of another small issue with the whole voting thing is it's like how, how many different bourbons are people trying you know yeah. 
if, if you only tried two, I try to say, Hey, it don't vote unless you've tried four to five. Obviously I'm not like checking people's bunkers before they're allowed to vote or anything. Uh, there it is. Bourbon or whiskey of the year market value just went up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Market value just went up by at least 25 cents. You just had the Oprah effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, things like the select yeah, stock too, nice. and, uh, cause even Kentucky owl did pretty good in the voting, but they're only, I think they only released like 1800 of batch six. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah, Kenny still, or, uh, Carrie still has his favorite of, yeah that's bad you're bad <laughs> <laughs> that's it so so greg ponder said he goes uh hillbillies in the middle of nowhere southern missouri can't get any true rarity so he said old forester 1920 was his best of 2016 is good it's a yeah. great bourbon so is um foolproof 1792 foolproof yeah. so is russell reserve single barrel Mm -hmm. great middle realm bourbons if you can find them yeah so let's go ahead and we'll kind of move on uh you know we've we've kind of hit on the uh the le's hit on the 2016 stuff so let's kind of move into to 2017 i just kind of want to kind of gauge you you know just a you know get your get your crystal ball out know your magic eight ball whatever it is and kind of think of what was, what's a 2017 prediction like what do you think is going to happen and shake up this world in 2017 that maybe people aren't expecting? I'll hop in. So we just did a whole, we just reached out to a ton of distilleries and a ton of their PR firms to find out just any tidbits we could and just scour to get some label hits and, and figure out what's going on for 2017 or at least that last week. There's a few things that I think really got ex excited, right? I think Willett's going to go on a tear, it looks like in 2017, um, which has a lot of potential excitement behind it, right? X, XCF, you know, another version of that potentially, potential 80th anniversary release, you know, or maybe we're going to see a wheat whiskey from them. It's going to be pretty exciting. And then, um, you know, I think we're going to see some things that might not excite us, but a lot of other people, right? Or from Barrel, I think their whole library collection coming out, a lot of people missed out and now they're really into it. Good, bad, or, or, or indifferent, it is what it is, right? Blade and Bow 22. I think Knob's going to take a shot at trying to bamboozle people with the 25th anniversary release, like their 2001. Um, my personal favorite, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Barrel Barrel uh, Barrel Rye comes, like the new Barrel Rye coming out, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be pretty exciting by Barrel Whiskey. Um, I think they've done a phenomenal job of stepping up and filling in for, I almost want to say they're like the new Black Maple Hill in my book. They're just doing phenomenal barrel releases. And uh, I think, you know, Joe, who runs Barrel, is just killing it. So I think it's going to be really exciting. Carrie, what do you think? I don't know. I'm kind of bored with bourbon right now. Okay. Moving on to cognac, I think. Cognac? Like, yeah, that's what I mean. Ryan came over the other night, and he brought a, a stellar bottle of rum, and we were drinking rum before we even started drinking bourbon. And Yeah, Fred uh, Minnick keeps pushing that one, didn't he? Say, I, I'm telling you what, man, we're we're really missing out. There's there's definitely some good ones on the market. So yeah, I just I think right. I don't understand why companies don't release anything in quarter one. Like it's always September to fall. December. Yeah, it's always yeah. fall, early winter. Like I'm walking around Total Wine, I want to buy something, and there's there's nothing out right now. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the uh, the four grain from. Buffalo Trace is going to be like, you know, their special yep. March release every year. Um, that's pretty much all I've, I've heard. You know, the Van Winkle ride, this was the last year of tanked Van Winkle rides. So we'll be getting, either this year or next year, we'll be getting Buffalo Trace's distilled Van Winkle ride, um, which will be interesting to see if that beats the stuff now, which I don't think it will, but it'll be interesting to see. Other than that, I guess it's just, you know, it's just there's so many craft distillers. You think they're going to start putting out stuff that's drinkable? Uh, they started. <laughs> you know, wow! <laughs> dig, dig the knife and twist it. Why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's like when will we get to stop judging craft? Saying yeah, it's good for craft. Yeah. To where yeah, it's like it's good for a two year. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think Wyoming has gotten there because um, I like their stuff. Um, but they still have some room to improve, but I, you know, the, the thing that I still, um, that Kentucky's got going for it is the outdoor aging of the barrels, all the, the craft distillers, they, 
their stuff is not that bad, but they're aging barrels inside of an air conditioned warehouse. Mm-hmm. And you just, I, you just don't get the heat and the barrels that I think you really need to get really good flavor out of it. And the grains, I think too, makes a huge difference. Cause you, yep. was it uh, Jim Rutledge who said, uh, crap in crap out. <laughs> if your moon, if your you know, white dog tastes like crap, it's going to taste like crap no matter how long it's in a barrel. So, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of craft distillers, and we, we're pulling for them. We want something else to root for. We just need to be proven wrong that Kentucky is um, not, you know, the old, the only place to make bourbon. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, I'll chime in. Um, I'm. I agree with Kerry. K- 2016 kind of got me bored with bourbon. Everything was kind of lackluster. Most of the releases, and. Uh, I think I'm just going to take a year and sit back and let these distillers release something that's fantastic again. Um, I, I'm excited for the craft distillers. I think we're getting some good product out of them. I am excited about the Willits uh, products I read about on the release. I hope those come true. I don't think they'll do an XCF again, um, just from from what I've heard. But uh, I am I, I do think the 80 year and then the weed is a possibility, and I'm excited for that. Um, other than that, yeah, rum's been kind of my new thing, new hobby right now. Um, some fantastic ones out there, but this is a bourbon show, so we'll, we'll talk about bourbon. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for sticking the topic there, Ryan. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) So it's okay. Ryan, have you had that barrels rum, the one that they aged in a bourbon barrel? I did. I had a, I had a sample at Fred's house and it it was fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And I'm excited too for what they got coming because they, they've done a really good job too. I got a couple of their bottles and yeah. they, they've done some quality stuff too, blending and kind of doing the, the whole barrel proof thing. I like it. Yeah. So what do you guys think? I mean, after this, it seems that um, most of the craft distilleries that are making a name for themselves are getting swooped up. Um, any kind of... Uh, predictions on who might be the next one if if there's any that might be the top of your head yeah i mean i think somebody like a like a koval or even yeah. few is getting pretty good distribution um but those th- that's that's a whole different animal because none of them are sourcing um i, I mean i honestly the one and and I know Joe at Barrels is really good guy, so I have no background information. But I, I feel like Barrel would be the next brand that could get uh, bought up by a large corporation just because – Just for the name. Yeah. Yeah, the name. Yeah. They've built a brand. They have pretty good distribution. Um, and, and the supply, I think, is a big issue. Um, so somebody like them could be next. Um, but, it's, you know, as far as 2017 goes – I, I think there's really no telling it, it seems while a few guys kind of go over to rum and that kind of stuff, I, I actually like rum, but you just don't get the variety you get within bourbon. Um, so I don't know is I would guess maybe barrel could get picked up in the next year or a true craft guy like few or Koval. But other than yep. that, I'm, I, I don't have many other guesses. I mean, thinking of the uh, big guys in general, um, who's is Mictor owned by anybody, or is that still kind of a family? no? They're, they're still private, yep. um, privately owned. It's uh, well, no. Um, what's their? They're not Castle. Uh, Jefferson's is Castle. Um, what's their like? Uh, no, it's uh, it's um. Ah, oh, we're all blinking over here, but it's okay. <laughs> We're the experts, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know Bomb- one. Gonna be- no, not Bomberg. Um, no, it's. Uh, I mean, okay. Anyway, speaking of Castle, as you brought that up, <laughs> what about Castle and Key as another potential, um, you know, investment opportunity right there for some big company to come in and. and yeah, run out? I mean, they've done a great job of marketing it, but I mean, I think they just started distilling, right? And I don't even yeah. know, if, are there yeah. any plans for an actual product anytime soon? Uh, you know, it's been cool to watch their progress, but as far as an gin, actual right? whiskey, Yeah, gin and uh, uh, definitely gin from yeah. when we talked to Marianne, she definitely okay. said gin, maybe vodka, but... Um, Cheatham Imports or Chatham Imports? Chatham. Chat, yeah, that's it. 
Yep. Or Chatham, however you pronounce it. Uh, so on, on the Castle and Key front, I know that they just filled their 100th barrel of whiskey this week. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So okay. they are That's distilling, um, and it's, it is aging. Um, also, from what I understand, is they've got more Rickhouse space than they know what to do with. So mm-hmm. they yeah, are also it. being a location for undisclosed aging of other barrels for people as well. Interesting. It's basically yeah. like half of the warehouse space now, isn't it? <laughs> so, I don't know if that's an official statistic, but. On the last uh, podcast, I mentioned an Atlanta distillery that was, I tried their bourbon at one year and they are aging outdoor in a warehouse and the stuff is awesome. It's only been aging for 16 months, I think. And uh, I'm not even going to say the name because people are asking me, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to Google it ourselves, which that is an interesting point. But I think we actually have the the inverse problem down in Florida is it gets nothing but heat. Yeah. yeah. So it it just speeds it way too fast. It's going fast. Yeah. And, you, you know, you, we haven't quite gotten anything that's in the three to four year mark, but, you know, anything in that 18 to two and a half year range has just been super oaky, woody, oh. um, pretty hot. Um, and the guys at St. Augustine, they released something and it was, it, it was pretty good. And they're really good guys. Like if you ever get to go on the tour, it's great. Um, but I just don't know if Florida is great for aging whiskey in a Rick house fashion. Um, you know, I think there may need to be a little more of the cool climate, but Atlanta who they do get some cold weather, they can probably, it probably works. Yeah. The seven yeah. days a year that we go under freezing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we get one day a year under 50 in Jacksonville. So that's, it's like winter will be held on this day. <laughs> <laughs> one thing craft distilling will do ultimately is, you know, there's all Buffalo trace is heavily into the experimenting, whether the certain position in the warehouse makes a difference where the heat versus the cold makes a difference. I think in a couple of years, you'll really know if, if heat and or cold and a combination of the two really give bourbon its, its flavor, you know, really like mellow out and age bourbon the way. Now that's an interesting concept. So you're saying it, you know, the story that always is told is, you know, the, the heat expands the wood, the bourbon goes into it, the cold condenses it, or I may have that backwards, but what, what, longer. And yeah. So in, in Kentucky has always said we have four seasons and it makes mm-hmm. sense that the best well, there because of the four seasons. But I think craft distillers will really kind of show the science behind it. Mm-hmm. National experience. Well, it's going to yeah. be hard to replicate here because only here is it 30 one day and the next day it's 70. Like, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you don't like the Kentucky here, you just wait another day and it'll yeah. change. Like, yeah. it's, it's so extreme highs and lows. And I just don't think you can replicate that anywhere. You do have four seasons there. You have cold winters and you have hot summers. Oh, yeah, yeah, for the most part. But, like, today, t- Saturday, it's going to be 70. Today, it was 39. You know, that's hard to replicate. Yeah. So, uh, this was kind of a, a, a good concept or a good prediction from Kyle Anderson. He said, more non-age dated, no, no more age statements. He says, even more are going to drop off. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good prediction, yeah. uh, you know. Honestly, how many are left? Um, Henry yeah, McKenna. No. Um, <laughs> Evan Williams. Well, like no, Henry, yeah. don't say Henry McKenna. <laughs> um, Eagle Rare is technically still 10 years, although it's very precarious that they uh, I'm surprised that's still on there. Moved it to the back label. Um, yeah, but let's it's see what else. It's huh? Huh. Nice release, I think, or four times. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still pretty available in most places. Happy um, Van Winkle's age dated. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is still pretty available. In yeah. Place. I don't know. A small batch. Yeah. Um, but that's pretty much it. Well, you know, what will be interesting is we'll probably go like two to three years of no age statements and everyone saying, you know, it's all about the flavor. We don't need age yeah. statements. And then somebody's going to come back and say, look, we put the age right on the bottle and it's going to be like a big eight, <laughs> yeah. you know, just in the middle of the bottle and everybody's going to buy it. And it's a then good age point. statements come back. Well, and, yeah. yeah. In the, when do you reverse the trend of, yeah. we took yeah. the age statements off. Nobody's buying our product. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to slow down our production 
and put the age back on it. We'll all be 10 years older doing the same podcast. Just say, it's back. We, we predicted this. I'm going to have less off my lawn. We're on Community Roundtable 2,485, and we are back. I won't even need a visor. I'll have no more hair. <laughs> oh, we do have an age stated uh, here in Kentucky, which I think is definitely going to be gone. Heaven Hill, six year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, y'all have some unfair advantages and in this, Kentucky. I don't even want to talk about those. It's, <laughs> I swear, know. once a week, I think I'm going to go just buy like five cases of it because mm-hmm. I just know they're going to take rid of, take it away some, at some point. Even like the Heaven Hill bottled and bond, we don't get yeah. we don't get bullet uh, barrel strength with it, which I thought was a really good release. Um, Stop Creek is losing its age step too. Is it dropping the nine? Mm-hmm. Completely. Yeah. I huh. think that Knob Creek's been gone for a while now. Yeah, it has. It that was a 2016 hunt. I mean, they needed to if they're going to keep trying to push all these limited Knob Creek statements. They need to. I mean, I don't want them to hear me say this, but if <laughs> they want to push a um, hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> Knob Creek bottle, they need to drop the nine-year age statement and don't do private barrels because most of the private barrels are better than what I've tasted from the Knob Creek 2001 limited edition. Um, I mean, and that's personal preference, but um, still. There's a a few 15-year private barrels that always squeak their way out the mm -hmm. market too. So Mm -hmm. I bet they'll do less and less of that would be my guess. So here is a, a prediction from Scott Rittenbaugh. He said, more finished whiskeys and used barrels, such as beer and wine. Um, he said, possibly a, a Jefferson's IPA Reserve. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> I think that's a joke. But, but it, isn't, the, isn't uh, beer and wine finished in X bourbon barrels? So then they're going to refinish it, bring it back. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah you can do that. Um, something. Catch twenty two uh, said uh, even Garrison Brothers is going to be releasing a port finished bourbon. Mm-hmm. But in my opinion, I'll, I'll stand in line for Garrison Brothers so I can pay one hundred and fifty bucks for crap. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I was, I was going to be up. I was going to be that harsh. I was just going to say I was like they kind of need the port finish to kind of like take some of the edge off. But you know that's they have a ninety nine dollars single barrel with no age statement with a gray wax on top and total wine and I'm, why do they price it so high <laughs> it was kind of interesting I, I i didn't understand that and then i tasted the cowboy bourbon and you know it, it was kind of the same thing i was like yeah it's pretty good for craft but it's hard to say it's worth 150 or 200 bucks or whatever they had it at right so John Dunn also he predicts that barrel proof is going to become widely popular just among the casual buyers. That's interesting. I think that's a pretty good yeah, prediction sure. because you you, you see yeah. that now like everyone just asking for barrel proof and um like like it's the only option. You know, any release that comes out, I actually stopped putting new labels on Bourboner because I felt like the same comment would be every time, oh this who cares about it? Give me barrel proof. I'm like, well, not every release has to be uncut, unfiltered. Uh, yeah, yeah, everybody wants a high age statement and barrel yeah. proof. Give me a 30 year old barrel proof. I'm like, well, it's gonna taste like turpentine, but why? Why do you want that? <laughs> And so the Catalina wine mixer said uh, maybe 2017. I don't know. I love that name, right? Uh, said the said 2017. Perhaps see a slight cooling of the secondary market. However, Nick Amadio uh, kind of went the reverse way. He said the second market is just going to spiral further out of control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens on that because it's got to stop at some point right but it, i don't think it is it this year no probably not but i just i think we're getting to a point where it's pricing itself out it's getting too crazy i i don't know i i don't see it slowing down just based off of other industries you know it's not as big as wine it's not as big as scotch but it's still a very small mm-hmm. scale compared to those that, on secondary pricing um, you know, unless some huge, uh, pappy fraud case hits and scares everyone away, 
Maybe that'll be my 2017 prediction. The feds <laughs> round up yeah. all secondary <laughs> sales and completely kill the market. Um, yeah, I just watched a documentary on Netflix about somebody who did that in the wine industry. Who yeah, the, the sour was it sour grape of grapes or sour grapes or yeah. something like that. But I, that yeah. made me think of it. I was like, somebody's going to do that in bourbon, and you know, sell a bunch of fraudulent pappies and B tax. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think they will. Um, it's just you know, I I don't keep. I, I just assume people are going to do anything they need to do to make money. So uh, eventually, I think it'll happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think the secondary market's not going to slow down. I think we're going to see more and more distilleries. I mean, we're ready to see it with like the celebration from Victor's, but I think more distilleries are just going to get involved in releasing really high end bottles and trying to sell them. So Buffalo Trace's whole donation with OFC, right? And I realize that's a charity thing, but so Nick from Breaking Bourbon, his wife got one for her charity. Gorgeous bottle. Who knows what it tastes like, but like gorgeous bottle. The packaging is unreal. Right. And people are actually like, people will start paying thousands of dollars for bourbon if they're like 200 bottles at a time and they're super special. It's just going to turn okay. straight to the scotch world and we're just going to okay. see that more and more and more. Mm -hmm. I one yeah. through, uh, we got one through our school. Yep. And, um, I got it delivered. I, I looked at it and it's pretty impressive, but yeah, right? I'm going to know what it tastes like. Yeah, you can't help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I faked a charity and I got two bottles of it. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Drink them with Coke right away. <laughs> it, if shot. they ask, I'm in big trouble. But <laughs> <laughs> hold on, how did you get that? We're gonna to to give her yeah. boner T-shirts for everybody. That is awesome. That's our next Patreon giveaway. <laughs> I need, I need one of those. <laughs> I'm gonna be like walking the dog in it, and people are like hiding their children. <laughs> Don't talk with him anymore. <laughs> so uh one last 2017 prediction uh aaron stark says we're gonna see higher prices um, oh yeah that's a given yep. yeah i think i think not just higher prices i'm gonna say an immediate like 20 percent increase like across the board um is gonna be do pretty you, standard do you think we'll see people raise their prices and then immediately raise it back down like the bookers thing again no stuff yeah <laughs> No, I that don't. Was the most I, thing. I think I think prices are gonna are gonna increase. Like I said, twenty percent across the board. But you're gonna see more stores that are gonna be doing um, a lot more kind of events or sales or whatever it is to try and say like, oh, we've got it ten percent or fifteen percent off this week versus somewhere else. So you know, come by your your Jefferson's Ocean over here. Yeah. Yeah. Did we ever finish up talking about? I know we talked about the Booker's price increase, but did we talk about the repeal? No, I don't think we Which was it. actually still a price increase. Um, okay. No, go ahead. Touch on it. I, I mean, I just thought it was it was brilliant marketing. And, you know, we, I said we, that. We predict. Well, let's let's be clear. I said it first. So we're going <laughs> to <we're gonna> go, <laughs> go to the, the tapes. I'll play the last. Yeah. yeah. Again. No, no, but I mean, it was. We. we basically said hey here's what will probably happen um you know obviously we weren't so confident in it but um everyone could kind of see that writing on the wall especially with what they did with makers you know a few years back um that's what i said too but, but they basically <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm actually just repeating your words back to you so it sounds good no but in they said you know for 2017, this will be the price. So they didn't say we're not taking bookers to a hundred dollar price tag. They just said, basically, we're going to slowly increase it over the next few years. Um, and we still just think people will buy it. You know, we're not going to increase the production, which that's a pretty big slap in the face to consumers who have been buying bookers and supporting bookers for a long time. Um, but yeah, that that was just that was a tough one to swallow for for me. It's like, you know, I've loved this bourbon. I feel like I've recommended it more than any other bourbon. And now it's like, oh, actually, we're just gonna make less of it. Not that we don't have more of it, we're just gonna make less and it's gonna be more expensive. So I still think that's crazy, even even though they've kind of come back and said, okay, actually it's only a fifteen dollar price increase or whatever it is. 
Yeah, I mean, anyone else? Any other thoughts? Basically, <laughs> mic drop right there because yeah, you and you and Carrie yeah. pretty much just hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's yeah. exactly what happened. I, I, you know, it was funny just because here in Kentucky, you know, everybody everybody flips out. There's hordes of people rushing out. I mean, I know Costco probably I think had like the lowest price in town that was like at forty six bucks, and they had like a couple hundred bottles, and they were cleared by the end of the week. Uh, so, I mean, there's going to be some people that are, um, they're, they're going to feel pretty sheepish, I guess you could say, um, that they, they're sitting on, I don't know, 15, 20 bottles of just one particular release of bookers thinking that they were going to save 50%, you know, over time, but mm-hmm. I guess they're only saving 15%. That was you, Kenny. Can you buy, go I, on buy I some? Bought one bottle. I bought one bottle. Oh, Which I was kind of frustrated because I wanted to do a, a tasting of like all of the 2016 batches. And now you can't even find them anywhere because yeah. everyone is an empty shelf. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez, I, I should not be hunting for regular bookers <laughs> this hard. You know, I still can't find batch three um, in, in a couple other ones. I'm like, oh, dude, yeah. 99 bucks. 99 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> so we're going to uh, kind of wrap this up, and I'm going to ask one last question to uh, to kind of just put some good information out there of, of, of kind of what we think. So is there a consensus for our favorite among the more easily obtainable high-proof um, or, yeah, higher-proof bourbons that are out there? So, in your opinion, you know, what do you like most? Do you like Stag Junior, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, um, E.H. Taylor Barrel Proof? Like, what are some other attainable ones, and and why? And I'll I'll push it to to carry first. Um, Old Forester, nineteen twenty. Uh, I said Barrel Proof. <laughs> uh, actually, of the Barrel Proofs, I still find Elijah Craig Barrel Proof to be the best of the big three. E.H. Taylor. Elijah Craig Barrel Proof and um, Stag Junior. Because um, ECBP is 12 years. None of the other two are over eight years, I think. Mm-hmm. So, nope. um, and it's still 60 bucks when you can find it around. So I still think that's the best barrel proof deal that you can get, even better than Booker's. Yeah, I totally agree on that one. It's just, it's, it's at least around Rhyme, it seems to be getting easier and easier, especially when I'm traveling to finding it versus the other two. And I think the cost for the, for the, taste is is great right it's a great it's awesome yeah i I, I would have to agree the uh the elijah craig barrel proof it's just hard to beat whenever you can see it on the shelf and it is kind of starting to hit a closer of that point of you know it uh you'll see it on the shelves more you with the first seven or so releases it seems like it hit the shelf and it was gone and now they kind of hang around a little more um but really all three of those I think are great releases. We get Stag Junior here for fifty bucks and kind of take it for granted. I still think it's a really good release. Um, and Elijah Craig, or excuse me, E. H. Taylor Barrel Proof is really good too. So I think you can save a lot of time in chasing if you just kind of go after those. Um, and you can't really go wrong with all three of those. Yeah, 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 for sure. Elijah well, Craig Barrel said, "Don't don't forget about some other ones such as Maker's Mark mm-hmm. Cash Strength and then 1792 yeah. Foolproof." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Foolproof is entry proof, right? Yeah. It's not really barrel proof. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's probably, pretty close. It's yeah. probably coming out at what maybe 130 at the top. Yeah, um, would be my guess. Um, Maker's Mark Cash Strength is actually really good. Um, and whenever they finally do a nationwide release of the um, 46. Yeah. What, what are they calling it? Bill Samuel select or something like that. Um, th- that would be a great yeah, one. The makers 46 uh, cast is just phenomenal in my book. Yeah. But again, it's Kentucky yeah. only, but if that goes nationwide, I think that'll do phenomenal. It's it's like, I agree. Hey, the makers 46 is just two additional weeks with some barrel staves. In it. Nine additional weeks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> barrel staves. So oh. let's. Uh, no, uh, no, yeah, no. It's it's nine weeks. Uh, it's a little bit older, and it's the the French oak staves. Yeah. Um, that are in there. So, but you know the ones I've had and the store picks that I've had have been really good. Yeah, agree. Yep. 
yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm with everyone else. Elijah Craig Barrelper is definitely the best out there on the market, although I do anticipate that losing an age statement soon also. I, I feel like so? I saw What's your face? It's not happening. I, I swear I saw a marketing piece the other day, and it was like a bottle redesigned for that, and there was no age statement on it. What? Um, yeah. I, I, I saw it online somewhere. But uh, anyways, that and the Four Roses barrel picks, you know, that are, I think they're usually barrel proof, and those can you can find those at usually any liquor stores. Those would be my two go-tos. Elijah Craig's probably a little harder to find around here, but uh, the Four Roses barrel picks are always solid. Good deal. So I think that uh, that kind of gets some good information out there for people that are wanting to uh, dip their toes in the barrel proof as we had made a 27 or somebody had, had mentioned as a 2017 prediction of people getting a barrel proof. Uh, there you get it from from the panelists here on the, the community roundtable. So I want to say, gentlemen, thank you again for, for joining me on yet another edition here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So we'll kind of close it out and again, tell everybody where they can read your blogs, get to know you send you Twitter and Facebook, you know, messages and all the other kind of good stuff. I'll go first because Blake will just repeat what I say. <laughs> <laughs> it's not repeating when you speak for her. So. <laughs> Suburbia.com, www.subourbia.com. On Twitter, follow me at bourbon underscore gamer. Um, don't forget to visit Towsy House Tavern, which was this week's restaurant pick. <laughs> Follow uh, Bourbon R on uh, Twitter and basically everywhere else he is because he's, he's everywhere. <laughs> Once again, gentlemen, I've had a blast. Thank you for having me tonight. Sure. This is uh, Jordan, one of the guys from Breaking Bourbon. So www.breakingbourbon.com, at Breaking Bourbon, all the social media accounts for the latest news, reviews, and our uh, daily release calendar. And yeah, thanks for having us. We always enjoy doing this. And I'm Blake from bourboner.com. Uh, no E, just bourbon with an R <laughs> on the end. And um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. It's bourboner.com. And then Instagram's bourboner and uh, or at bourboner and then there's a facebook group as well if you if you search for that um and actually i'm also on tumblr too i believe uh my cousin told me he followed me on tumblr and i didn't realize i had a tumblr account so uh if you're on tumblr you can you can check it out there i think it's just only my instagram posts go there so um, what's your myspace account <laughs> my myspace is tom <laughs> It's uh, myspace.com backslash Tom. <laughs> Just him and Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie has ruined uh, Bourboner for me. All I can think My of Friendster wrong. account is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What about Ryan? Ryan did give a show. Yeah, you can find me wherever Kenny's about to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I want to say thank you all again for uh, for joining us tonight, and thank you everybody that tuned in on YouTube Live. Uh, it was great to kind of get uh, your suggestions, your questions, and your input as well. Uh, always great to have a lot of people kind of chiming in and, and sharing that information. You can, uh, if you do like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit, and you can follow us on those great social media channels: Instagram, Facebook uh and twitter and myspace and tumblr and reddit and all those great places at bourbon pursuit uh, actually hey, just this Ryan, yes sir for the uh, awesome podcast keep up the great work guys oh thank you definitely yeah, thank appreciate you so much it. appreciate so, what y'all uh, do yeah ryan close it out for us man yeah thanks again guys for hanging out with us chatting it's always fun good fun love the the camaraderie we have but uh if you know, any of the listeners have show suggestions, comments, feedback. We're here for you. So just let us know who you want to hear, what you want to hear, and, and we'll bring it to you. So we'll see you next time. Hey, we, we stole a typical, like, it says, like, you know, like, there's a chance this is bourbon. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I changed it this time, and it says, because they don't make bourbon koozies. And thinking, you know, okay, you know, it's unique, it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, now I kind of want to have, have do like a last minute change that says, you give me a Bourboner. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey. And for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. <laughs>